The first part is in the public session, but I have to begin by asking if, if there are any declarations of interest. No. No. Thank you very much. And Shirley, can I ask you if there are any apologies? Yes, I have apologies from Jason Kenny, Luke Stubbs, Tim Metcalf, and Lucy Hudson. Then. Thank you. Noted and recorded. The first item on here is the chair's report. I have nothing particular specific to report because uh, paper item five is an annual review of the joint audit committee. So if there's any issues, we can pick them up there maybe. So if we go on to the minutes of the last meeting, item four. First of all, has anyone got any issues with the accuracy of the minutes? Not seeing any hands. I don't think there are any outstanding actions. So I think without more ado, unless anyone has any questions on any of the items. Any questions? Points? No? OK, so we'll move on to item five. As chair of the JAC, uh, I'm required on behalf of the JAC to produce an annual uh, report of what we've done. Uh, there it is. This report has been agreed with all members of the Joint Audit Committee. If anyone's got any uh, points or questions or queries on this report, please, please ask. Otherwise, uh, we can move on and take it that this annual review has been considered by this committee. Any questions? No? OK. That's considered and no questions on that, uh, Shirley, for your uh, purposes. So item six is the Treasury Management and Investment Strategy. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Gemma has um, joined us, so Gemma will take us through uh, the key points of the report. That's OK. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So Treasury Management is the management of the Police and Crime Commissioner's cash flows borrowing and investments and the associated risks. The SIPFA code requires the Police and Crime Commissioner to approve a Treasury Management Strategy Statement before the start of each financial year. This report fulfills that requirement. I'd just like to draw your attention to the new liability benchmark section starting on page 21 of your papers. The liability benchmark is the lowest level of debt that the Police and Crime Commissioner sorry, Commissioner could hold if it used all of its balances, reserves and cash flow surpluses to fund its capital financing requirement. The PCC expects a negative liability benchmark across the first four years of the forecast period, which means that currently there's not a requirement to borrow during this period. The chart shows that until 2035, it's expected that the external borrowing that the Police and Crime Commissioner has already arranged would be sufficient being above the minimum borrowing requirement and therefore no additional borrowing is required. Based on current estimates, it is expected that additional external, external borrowing will however be required between 2035 and 2044. However, a limitation of liability benchmarking is that the further out the forecast, the less it can be relied upon and the requirement to borrow may change and either may not be there for the whole period or alternatively, cash flow requirements that may that are not known about today may become present later, which may require the PTC to take additional external borrowing in the future. The Police and Crime Commissioner currently holds £29.7 million of loans, which is a decrease of £500,000 on the previous year. And this reduction in borrowing balances reflects the maturing of Public Works Loan Board debt, which hasn't been replaced. The Treasury Management Strategy, the Investment Strategy, the Police and Crime Commission's objective when investing is to strike an appropriate balance between risk and return, minimising the risk of incur incurring losses from defaults and the risk of receiving unsuitably low investment income. The investment limits um, are available from page 29 of the report. And the strategy puts investment limits in place to ensure that appropriate diversification is achieved in its investment portfolio. 
The maximum that will be lent to any one organisation other than the UK government will be £13 million, which is an increase in comparison to the previous Treasury management strategy, strategy due to temporarily increased investment balances, which is due to long term financial planning for the Police and Crime Commissioner's reserves, which will come to fruition over the longer term. Arlen Close advised that the maximum lent to any one organisation is set at 10% of the highest expected cash balances. And during the 12 months to the 31st of December 2021, the highest balance was just over £130 million. Therefore, the adjustment to increase the limit to £30 million is appropriate. Increased limits allow the flexibility to ensure that all of the police and crime commissioners' cash can be invested in accordance with this strategy. Also, for this reason, the limit in principle invested beyond a year has been increased within this strategy from £15 million to £20 million, which will allow the Police and Crime Commissioner to benefit from more beneficial interest rates, which are generally applied to longer term investments. The only other thing I was going to mention was that the Police and Crime Commissioner made a payment of just under £12 million on the 1st of April 2021, which was to prepay its employers' local government pension scheme pension contributions for one year. And by making this payment in advance, the Police and Crime Commissioner was able to generate an estimated saving of £257,000 over the year on its pension contributions. And so subject to any unforeseen cash flow requirements, the Police and Crime Commissioner also plans to prepay its employers' LGBS pensions contributions for one year again on the 1st of April 2022, which will generate an estimated saving of around £265,000 for the 2022-23 financial year. That was all I was planning to say, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for that very uh, clear <clears throat> run through. Peter, you have a question. I have three, <clears throat> three very brief comments, I hope. First of all, on the very last point you made, I just want, I'm, I think we've maybe raised this before, but I can't find it in my notes. How exactly does the prepayment generate the saving? So the prepayment is worked out by the pension services team and there is a discount applied. So the contributions are worked out for the year um, and then a discount is applied um, of just over 2%. And that is the amount that the Police and Crime Commissioner expects to pay. And then there's levelling up at the end of the year because um, although pension services can estimate how much the Police and Crime Commissioner will be required to play, pay in employer contributions due to changes in staff and salary, et cetera, that can change. So there is a levelling up, but because the 2% reduction at the saving is applied right at the beginning of the year, that's how it's applied. Is that clear? Sorry, so in, in other words, you're getting, you're getting um, effectively uh, sort of credited with the interest saved or interest earned on the, on the, on, on the, on that sum. But the net saving obviously has got to be um, less what you fail to earn on that money invested during the year. So it can't be. That's a gross figure, isn't it? It's not a net figure. That saving. Yes. Okay. Great. The next question was on paragraph five eight. You may have covered it, but it says means that currently there is not a requirement to borrow during this period. Does that mean not a requirement to borrow anything more in this period? Yes. OK, so because clearly there's a requirement to borrow during the period. There's just not a requirement to increase the borrowing. Exactly. OK, yes. and 6.1, yes. you say, and this is just a clarification, Table one shows the PCC will maintain a net investment position. It may need to borrow to maintain its long term and minimum level of investments. I just wanted to be clear on that. I can see that if it has long term investments, it can be expensive to pull them down and therefore some borrowing may be cost effective to avoid that happening. But I don't understand. I'm not quite sure I understand the term minimum level. Okay. of investments. Yep, so minimum level of investments, we would need to have um, at least £10 million at all times to meet the requirements of MIFID 2, which came into 
into regulation of I think it was 2017 or 2018 but basically um, it allows the police and crime commissioner to act as a professional investor which allows us to be able to access um, all the types of investments we'd like to um, instead of instead of being a, um, a retail investor like my, I would as, a, as an individual. Are you saying that you don't have 10 million pounds to invest as an individual? <laughs> No, I don't. I wish I did. That'd be lovely. OK, so I understand. Can I, I didn't quite catch uh, the you, you referred to the regulator or the regulation that imposed this, that gave this, um, that set this criteria. What what was yes. it again? Sorry. It was called MIFID 2. Huh. We did. We did bring that through the Joint Order Committee at the time. Um, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, That's, fine. That's all. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Peter. Gordon. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. One you may not be able to answer, but you may be able to comment. And the first is the obvious question. Uh, this is a historical document. Things like, you know, you've set all your borrowing requirements, etc. cetera. Um, uh, at one point, uh, I, because I don't have hard copies and if I flick, um, I'll lose my place uh, on, this, uh, on the document. One point you were saying was um, about uh, Sorry, you've set all your borrowing requirements, et cetera, for the forthcoming year. At one point, you were talking about the rate of inflation and that the investors are uh, saying the inflation rate is higher than what you'd anticipate. Why would you anticipate a lower interest rate than what other investors would be anticipating? Um, I'm very sorry, but I'm not sure I, I yeah. said that. Is there a part in the report Sorry. you're referring to I, I can yeah it, it doesn't matter but i okay i mean it's uh, it's all right the real crux of the question is um what's going to happen in the very short term future because a lot of your costs are going to increase in terms of energy prices etc and with higher inflation means a higher cost of buying in services for uh, the, the pcc Yes, I mean, that's uh, really been taken account of, Gordon, in the budget that myself and Richard have put forward through the PCC um, yeah. that was approved um, this week by the Peace and Crime Commissioner. So we've built in, um, certainly for pay, what we believe to be a reasonable allowance, although, um, as Richard and I discussed this morning, um, rates have gone north again since since those kind of um, estimates went in. We've got 3.5% baked in for pay for next year. Uh, sorry, for yeah, yeah, for next year, 22-23. Um, across the board for so policing and police staff and OPCC. Um, we've also got specific rates built in where we've got contracted inflation, and some of that will account for mm. utilities um, where we forward yeah. purchase yeah. that to the Kent Laser Agreement. Um, so for, as far as we can, can, we've covered off inflation. Um, and in my CFO report to the budget, uh, we, we highlight kind of inflation as a risk, but we note that uh, we highlight a whole host of risks actually. Um, but my commentary on that is that unless all those risks came together at once, which is extremely unlikely, um, we we're well resourced from a reserves point of view and we should be able to manage, you know, kind of in-year fluctuations through the reserves process should we need to. So it's a risk, but I think it's a risk that's manageable, certainly yeah. in the sh to medium term. That's great. Thank you. And my other question is on uh, Para 5.3 when you talk about usable reserves. Uh, I mean, you, reserves are always a double-edged sword, you know, you can hedge your bets or um, but uh, and also once you use it for other things, then you lost that. Mm -hmm. Now how, you were talking about reducing your reserves. Um, how low do you intend to keep reducing it to? Uh, well, at the moment, I think we're sat at around 100 million pounds worth um, of reserves, um, and the, they are forecast to come down over the course of the medium-term plan. Uh, but that includes a whole host of assumptions about things that may or may not happen and spend that we will commit to. So. Um, Again, at the moment, I'm, my CFO statement on the robustness um, of the estimates and the reserves position is, is very positive. We're in a good position, um, not only in and of itself, but if you look at us across the board against other PCC and constabularies, I think you'll find that we're, you know, we're very well set up to withstand any shocks that may come our way over the next couple of years. We're, we're very well resourced from a reserves position. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just a sort of a similar question on the first one, but slightly different. In, on paragraph four point three, we talk about expected uh, inflation six percent and peaking in April twenty two. 
Well, having listened to the financial forecast last week, where they were talking about seven and a quarter percent inflation, and maybe it's not going to peak in April, but no one really knows. I'm just wondering what the impacts and implications will be. And I guess as we've got, we hold a lot of investments, there could be uh, increased money in it for us. Uh, yeah, I think it's a simple answer um, from an investment point of view. It's positive. Um, at the moment, we've not got a need to borrow because um, we're internally borrowed, so we don't need to go to the market. So we're not in a rising rate environment from that perspective either. So um, in the short, again, the short to medium term rate rises from a treasury management point of view are, are positive or should yeah. be positive. OK, thank you. Has anyone any more questions on treasury management? No? Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for answering those questions so so um, clearly. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gemma. So we we'll move on to the next item, which is the internal audit progress report. Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a routine um, progress report update from me. Um, so uh, just to confirm that all of the um, work that's assigned to quarter four has been allocated and has been scoped or is in the process of being scoped. Um, so that's all on track to complete in time for year end and annual reporting. There's a few still um, uh, quarter three, three reviews ongoing, but most of those are coming um, to the end now. Um, and then there's also the high level overview of the um, overdue management actions. Um, as you know, that's that number's been gradually over um, coming down um, over time and, and is subject to a, a more detailed report um, well, from officers uh, later in the agenda. Uh, but uh, I think it's what is positive there is that the majority of those reports relate to 2021. So, um, you know, very few um, long overdue actions, so to speak. Um, so that was all I was going to say as part of that one, but happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you, Karen. On the said table on page 51 of Outstanding Actions, we have a paper in part two which uh, tells us the position on some of the outstanding recommendations. There's one on OPCC safeguarding, uh, which isn't in that paper, which I guess we'll, we'll hear about in uh, the second part of the, the meeting. Um, any questions for Karen? No. Uh, Catherine. Just a quick one on vetting, Karen, which looks like it's one you're about to start. Um, was that a late addition um, in light of Sarah Everard or was that something that you were always going to do? Um, that was a variation into the plan. Um, I, th I think uh, I'm just trying to remember what it, it took the place of. I'm just going to go to the table at the back. Um, uh, yeah, so um, we had a review of uplift in the plan and that was removed in favour of the vetting review, um, given all of the um, issues nationally. So I think that is a good example where um, we have a regular liaison with the constabulary and colleagues from from the OPCC to regularly review the relevance of the plan, bearing in mind the plan is sort of set a year in advance, so to speak, and the, and the risk um, uh, the, the risk environment changes uh, quite rapidly. So that was one of those examples where that was felt to um, be priority review over over some of the others. Sure, and that makes perfect sense. So presumably you'll look at the process as it operates now, but obviously yes. there might be some national changes, I guess, in the light of reviews going on elsewhere. Very much so. So that'll be looking at the the uh, processes in place currently. Um, and, you know, if, if changes are brought in, then obviously um, we can bring that back to the table to review at a later date um, if, if it's deemed necessary. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. You're on mute, Peter. I wasn't on the last meeting. I don't know why I had to unmute myself. Um, Karen, sorry, yes, it wasn't specific to any of the particular areas. I just wanted to understand what the mechanism is when something is taken out of the audit plan, because obviously 
we don't um, uh, we don't I don't think we approve the audit plan as such, but we are consulted on it and we express ourselves happy that there are areas that we are concerned about that are being covered, etc. But when things are taken out, it doesn't seem to me that we necessarily are consulted or are told. That's the first point. The second point is just a blunt question. Can the PCC or the chief constable or the PCC and chief constable together unilaterally just say, I don't want that in, I want something else? Or does it have to go wider? Because obviously, let's just say we were talking about um, uh, uh, grants or something like that, which might affect, might relate directly to the PCC's behaviour or decisions or potential corruption. Obviously, I'm not talking about, our, you know, our PCC. It, there might be every reason to say, well, let's not have let's not have that audited for the moment. I've got a very good reason for auditing estates or something else instead. What what is there any safeguard about the 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 person who might benefit or otherwise from that particular audit being taken out actually being the proactive person who says right we won't have that done for another year how does it work thank you peter i think that that's a really good question and and i think a lot of it um comes down to the the actual approach we take to planning um so it, it is a risk-based um, approach to planning um, and we also try to incorporate the views as many officers as possible across the APCC and, and constabulary. So we have an established group uh, where we have those discussions and we bring in extra people at that time as well to, to get wider views. Um, we review the risk registers. So there is a, quite a robust dialogue that goes on around the audit plan. Uh, and as you recall, when we set the plan for the current year, it was actually quite a lot higher than the resources um, uh, that we, we actually had traditionally agreed with you. So there was always going to be some degree of prioritisation needed. And, and I think we'd included quite a lot of days um, in anticipation of a new PCC um, and whether that those um, days would be needed. Um, uh, and also lots of uncertainty around the national um, picture around whether there would be any need for review. Sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is uh, yes. Do you hear me OK? Yes, I can just we can hear you, but there is feedback. Yeah. Um, so, so that's in terms of the in terms of the actual planning, Peter. We we have that really good, honest, open, frank dialogue, and I think a lot of it comes down to relationships as well over, over the way that those relationships have developed. So I think we have got a very open and honest um, uh, relationship. Um, and then once that um, plan is approved, we review it regularly through our uh, liaison meetings. Um, with the OPCC and constabulary. Um, but inevitably, as I said just now, you know, we're, we're already setting the plan in sort of last November, December, ready for 22, 23. So potentially we're including some areas that wouldn't be reviewed until a year's time. And as you know, I mean, it's such a dynamic um, environment in, in the sector that things are changing quite quickly. So it's right and proper that we, we do keep the plan under review. Um, and, and change it as needed. So what tends to happen is we have those conversations in our, li uh, our, our liaison groups around um, whether it is a, the, still the appropriate timing to have um, those reviews in the plan. Uh, and if it's if it's deemed not, then we 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 understand and have have that um, discussion around why that timing is not appropriate. So there is a clear justification for it, rather than uh, we you know it's just not convenient, so to speak. Um, and then those changes get reported in this progress report. So there's a table at the end um, of my report on page, I think it's 56 of your pack, which shows that clear trail between what was agreed at the beginning of the year, what's come in, what's gone out. So there is an opportunity for you to comment. Um, and obviously these papers get um, widely circulated um, uh to to everybody so i think that's the process we go through does that does that answer your question sorry you're on mute again peter um it does answer part of my question i still think probably um in practical terms the audit committee finds out after the event 
you know, when the audit plan is put in place, we're consulted from the uh, beginning and we can comment on it. But we found out after the event when it's factually when it's actually too late to do anything about it, about items being removed. But that's a matter of degree, I suppose. I was just interested in the in the governance side of, you know, there have been issues, as we all know, very public issues of problems of um, corruption of one sort or another involving PCCs and others. What actually, what, let me just put it this way, what actually would happen if the PCC said to you, I don't want, um, I just, I just, I've just decided I don't want that area dealt with, do something else. Is there any reason the PCC can't say that? What are the safeguards? Well, well, I think it, it comes think back we, to the, yeah. the dialogue and justification. Oh, sorry, Andy, but you know that there, there does need to be a justification for removing something from the plan. And ultimately, I think Peter, um, you know, as, as CFO, Chief Exec, um, you know, we're going to say we to remove it. Yes, OK. But that's our statutory requirement, isn't it? If we think somebody's going to lose that, we will put it in the plan. Yeah, so, so in other words, the senior officers have a sufficient responsibility in terms of governance that they would not, they would, unless they were involved in some some problem, that they wouldn't step aside and, as it were, allow an important item to be removed if they thought it was a critical. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and, and uh, if I may add something to that, um, as far as the audit committee is concerned, we would know about the plan, the deletions or changes, albeit retrospectively. But I believe our relationship with Karen, who is uh, the head of internal audit, would be, is such that were she to, heaven forbid, suspect that there was anything like you suggested uh, going on, she would liaise very closely with myself and other members of the committee. So exactly I think it's the relationship. That. Thank exactly. you, Chairman. Can I, can I just add that I think, um, you know, in terms of my independence, you know, that there are there are many safeguards outlined in the charter that we'll come on to next. So, you know, I have a direct direct um, reporting line um, to the chairman um, and to yourselves. We meet in private. Um, I've got direct reporting lines to Richard and Andy, uh, but also to the chief constable and PTC should I need it. So. There are lots of checks and measures in that relationship that, that safeguard my independence and my ability to challenge, if you like, um, some of those decisions oh. if they give me concern. Thank you, Karen. Peter. I, that's fine. Thank you very much. OK. On that same note, um, um, for, the, for those uh, members of the committee, we have uh, Neil Chevelle will be attending the dialing into the confidential session um, for us to better answer questions. But while we're talking about this, this issue, you will notice that on page nine of Karen's report, I think it's page 54 of the uh, all the papers, there's a list of TVP collaboration audits for 2021-22. And certainly I was going to ask him about the last item on there, ICT management of Microsoft 365 security, where there is an audit which has been removed or maybe postponed. One of the reasons being lack of ICT resources to support the review, which doesn't fill me with uh, a great deal of comfort. But that's a question I will ask Neil in the second part of the meeting. OK, Peter, your hand's still up. Peter? Ah, no. OK. Are there any other questions on the progress report? No? OK, still you, Karen, on the plan. Thank you, Chair. Um, so again, um, a, a pretty standard offering for me from me at this time of the year. Um, this report covers the charter and the proposed plan for 22-23, so leads quite nicely on from the conversation we've just had. Um, the charter I just bring to you um, every year, um, there's, there's, it's in line with audit standards. There's no changes really to what um, you've agreed previously. Um, it, it's just there uh, for the opportunity for clarification of roles and responsibilities um, and any questions that you may have. 
Um, so sort of the more meaty bit of the report is the plan. And just to remind you that the internal audit plan is pretty much covered in three parts um, now. The Hampshire Constabulary part of the plan, which is presented to you today, which is um, my responsibility for delivering. Um, we've got the shared services arrangements with Hampshire County Council and Hampshire and Isla White Fire and Rescue Service and um, the collaborations where TVP lead. Um, so unfortunately, due to the timing, um, I haven't um, we haven't got the, the plans yet for the shared services and TVP aspects. Uh, but I will add them into my progress reports as and when they become available um, because they go through separate and, and quite distinct governance processes for approval. So as, as regards the Hampshire Constabulary Plan, as I said just now, um, we've, we've consulted um, with key officers across the OPCC and Constabulary. And as part of that discussion, we've also sought views on the shared services and TVP aspects. So I've been able to have dialogues um, with Neil Chevelle um, and and others around those plans. So hopefully um, we can reflect, um, you know, the various uh, viewpoints in in those plans going forward. And and as I've just said, you know, it is a plan. Um, it covers the whole financial year, so it will remain fluid. We we'll regularly review it over the year um, to make sure that we can accommodate any new and emerging risks um, should they take priority. Um, but I think that in terms of sort of highlights, that's that's all I wanted to say. And again, very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Karen. Liz. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just looking. Sorry, I'm just feed back. You hear me? You hear me? Okay. Page 72, where you list your client portfolio and it seems to me also you know there's stakeholder partners and external clients seems to me that, that list is getting longer are you taking on more partners and or clients and can you explain to me the governance of um southern internal audit and how what weight is given to stakeholders and or partners and external clients. How 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 is it all managed? Thank you, Liz. Um, excellent question. I'll try and be uh, uh, try and be concise. <laughs> so yes, we are a partnership, um, and what we have in that is um, it's hosted by Hampshire County Council, um, but there are a number of um, key partners, as you'll you'll see in the list there, the um, key stakeholder partners who all have a place on um, a stakeholder partnership board. So there's a governance, there is a governance structure in place. So um, e each partner has a seat on that board and therefore has a, a, a say over the future direction um, of the partnership. We don't actively market ourselves, um, but we do find that through um, word of mouth and um, reputation that, that we do get uh, approached by organisations uh, from time to time. So and if it's right and proper and um, it seems like a, a, a sort of a, a beneficial way forward, um, we do take on um, new partners in a considered way, because um, obviously uh, we need to make sure that we remain uh, resourced to deliver our existing commitments. Um, in a fairly niche market. So it, it is a considered growth um, over time. Uh, we only established in um, 2012, um, so it has been quite a steady growth um, since that time. Um, but um, hopefully uh, we continue to um, survey our stakeholders. We're just about to do another stakeholder survey um, in a month or so. Um, so we're, we're obviously always continuing to get the feedback to make sure that we are continuing to meet our obligations um, effectively. So does can that, I just does that help? Can ask you, the external clients, are, is that a contractual fee paid relationship? Um, the, they're a slightly different arrangement um, in, in as much as they're not, uh, they're not partners and they don't have a seat on the key partnership board. Um, 
but obviously some of those are very much aligned to some of the key stakeholders, the pension funds, which are separate, but um, a separate organisation, but they're not part of the shared service per se. So, um, so yes, they are slightly different arrangements. Um, those they're, they're either um, sort of as a result of a relationship with a key partner or, or their attended um, service. And do the auditors rotate between the different organisations or do they tend to focus on their one area of specialty? Um, it, it's it's a mix depending on um, who, who we're talking about. So at a management level, um, we all have assigned portfolios. So we work with a more defined and limited group of, of clients. I, for example, look after all of the blue light clients, um, some of Hampshire County Council and um, further education. Um, whereas um, others obviously will be more local authority um, based. Then the audit managers, we have a, a pool of audit managers who manage those contracts day to day and again are, are assigned key um, portfolio responsibility. And that's because we need to manage the relationships at a senior level uh, and ensure we, we understand the operation of each organisation and the risks that, that are faced in the sector. And below that, we've got a pool of staff basically who can deliver anywhere, any when. Um, so they are used interchangeably so that we've got fresh eyes and rotation so that we're not having the same people look at the same systems all the time. But the idea behind that is also so that we can share best practice across the organisations. That's one of our, um, I guess, our selling points as a partnership is that we're looking at systems across, across a wide base of public sector organisations and can um, can share that best practice and, and thought process. So again, we try not to spread the people too thinly um, and we've got people that perhaps do slightly more work in, in police or local authority. Um, but the idea is to have that resilience and um, flexibility uh, to make sure that we can can um, deliver our commitments. And within that pool, we've got specialists in IT and fraud as well. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I've, remem I've remembered to unmute, Chair. Um, Karen, another couple of things I just saw in my notes. Sorry, I didn't mention it earlier. One was that there's two risk management audits. Yes, um, it doesn't specifically say so, but it seems to be that one relates to the PCC and one relates to the Hampshire, one relates to Hampshire Constabulary. Yes. Why was it thought, because the, the audit committee has from time to time sort of highlighted the rather art, the artificial split in the sense that really one one organization's risks are the other organization's risks, etc. And given today, one of the things we want to raise is that suddenly the risk register, for example, for Hampshire is suddenly presented in a completely different way to us. So anyway, that's not for you, obviously. Why, why was it thought appropriate that you would um, run two different, you would run two separate um, uh, audits on risk management between the two organisations? Or will it in practice, will you be looking at them together? Um, I think it, it's sort of a mixture of the two, Peter. I think we tried to do a joint review the first time we looked at it, but the processes are, are obviously delivered by different teams in the in the yeah. different organisations. And whilst there's collaboration and, and crossover between the two, they are nevertheless two distinct risk registers and, and reporting structures. So it can get quite messy trying to report on two different effectively systems in one report. So we felt that it was continued to be um, beneficial to keep them separate. Um, that said, we, we will be looking at the way um, that communication works across the two organisations as part of that to to look at common areas of risk. Um, but I think, you know, in practical terms, um, it, it makes sense to do two reviews. OK, so my follow up on that is and I, it's nothing I'm not, I'm not permitted to say this. But could you actually look at the way in which um, the risk registers are communicated to the audit committee and whether there could be some common way of presenting it? Because at the moment there isn't and it's been highlighted by today's um, agenda. My second question was I see that. You've obviously someone's already mentioned the vetting 
that you're looking at vetting. Um, I just wonder whether there's any discussion, and, and obviously that goes to conduct and, and, and other issues, but was there any discussion of widening that to look at all aspects of um, monitoring uh, and um, dealing with misconduct of all kinds? I mean, we've just had, for example, the horrific report on the Westminster uh, police station, the absolutely horrific report, it, it, almost as if the Metropolitan Police didn't know what was going on in that police station. So I just wondered whether there was any discussion of taking it wider than vetting, because there's all sorts of metrics, um, analysis, et cetera, that can be used to identify where this may be a problem, analysis of, of um, social media, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, uh, predictive, predictive metrics and all the rest of it. I just wondered whether there was any discussion of it, particularly in terms of expanding it in the light of the most recent horrors from Westminster. I mean, vetting, it just seems to me it's it's part of the problem only. Um, I think casting my mind back to our um, planning discussions, we did have a sort of a general, um, we had a general discussion around ethics and, and so forth. But obviously PSD have got a significant role in, in all things conduct and behaviour. So um i think i think they are a very key key player in that uh, and so so nothing further at this stage has been put into the internal audit um report but i think probably a lot of that would come out of that psd space and i'm seeing that hands have flown up from um the dcc and richard who probably would want to take that further PSD. PSD, the Professional Standards Department. Yeah, but that, that's not in the Hampshire Police, is it? Is that Hampshire Police or is that national? Do you want me to come in on that? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, that'd be helpful. So <laughs> just, you, just, just on that, yeah, so the Professional Standards Department, PSD, is a department within Hampshire Constabulary. Every, every force has its own professional standards function in, in the Met. It's called the DPS. Um, but in effect, what that means is we handle public complaints and internal, uh, I, I'll call them, uh, you know, rep reports where individuals will, for example, indicate a, a particular concern about a, a member of the organisation and then it's investigated proactively. So it will deal with those public complaints and also any kind of allegations of potential misconduct. Um, so as, as um, Karen says, that, that there's a lot of management information and performance information which tracks through our professional standards department general routine battle rhythm of operation. Um, there is a scrutiny mechanism in through the PCC's office as well in relation to that. Uh, and there's a, a clear role there for the PCC in relation to uh, oversight and governance. And, and, and the, the new chief exec and I are working through exactly how we both want to develop that uh, over the course of, of this period as well. So the, I wasn't there for the kind of precursor conversations around the the um, the audit particularly, but vetting particularly is one of those distinct pieces of the whole picture, if you like, around misconduct management that I think is generally a concern is being reviewed nationally as well. So certainly from a, a force perspective, at some, some rigor and audit around that particular and distinct element is really important. And of course, it stems out of the Wayne Cousins case where of course he had been a transferee from another force into the Met so had been subject to police vetting albeit in a different organization and so particularly it's the way that vetting links from one police entity if you like to another that is particularly is particularly key now we we in Hampshire do have a really rigorous vetting process and we do a lot of uh, wider checks on social media and the like which we have had in train for some time which are not routine in a number of other forces so uh, hopefully that will give you some uh, wider reassurance but I, I certainly welcome the, the the focus on on the on the vetting aspect of that particularly just come back very quickly on that I mean that's all fine and I think I've been on the audit committee long enough to know that the culture from the top in the constabulary is is very solid and the leadership is solid on conduct etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know it's all very well saying well we have our own uh, PSD the Met has its equivalent of the PSD and yet Westminster occurred which is just absolutely catastrophic in terms of public relations etc what I thought Karen was saying was 
well, we'll look at vetting, but we've got a PSD department that looks at other things. Surely you're just part of Hampshire Constabulary, just like everybody else. I don't understand why your systems, whether you've got all the resources you need, whether you use the right metrics, you know, there's a center for um, uh, database policing, et cetera, who say they have systems for predicting when these problems may arise, et cetera. I, I can't see why it wouldn't be useful given the horrendous uh, reputational issues that, that can arise from this. Why it wouldn't be uh, useful to have the audit, or some, if not now, but at some point, audit that really, really critical part of, of Hampshire Constabulary. I'm not saying it's not being done properly, but we don't, we, we have no idea really. No, no, it's a really fair point, Peter. I guess I wasn't there for the kind of conversation about content. Richard might be able to come in on that in a moment, but I think you're 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 kind of you know you're you're highlighting. I think, Peter, the um, the, the whole the whole structure and framework of uh, of misconduct management, which you know there is an independent office of police conduct as well to supplement, obviously, what what police forces do. But you're right. Ultimately, police forces do investigate police themselves uh, and so you know scrutiny and audit and transparency around that is is really important really really we really, really care about as well so uh, i think that i personally would absolutely get your point I, i'm not i'm not certainly saying that we should not look at some of those broader areas um i guess it's it's a factor of how how we do that when we would do that um and i'm certainly open to it peter not, not, not an issue could at all we, could somebody who's not there has to say could we not just flag up that he would be interested in when the draft audit plan, the next draft audit plan is produced, look, looking at those areas and, and fleshing out some of the things that uh, might be worth looking might be worth looking at as a as a precaution. Okay. What, what I'd say is it's, prob it's probably worth at some stage, um, Chair, thinking about whether it might be worthwhile having another training session for the committee on PSD, because uh, Liz will recall that we've had training um, before from PSD as to what their role is, what their obligations are, what standards they work to, uh, what the safeguards and checks are around their activity as well. And it's quite a considerable area to get into. And of course, as Ben says, the, our PSD include police officers who have warrant powers, they have access to um, investigatory powers which are not accessible to internal order. And so it, it makes sense for us to undertake certain pieces of work through PSD rather than through internal audit. And I think if we just um, were able to give a little presentation on the powers and the responsibility that PSD have, then that might help to understand when we sit down with Karen and we decide which matters might be best dealt with through internal audit and which matters might be best dealt with through anti-corruption unit within PSD say then we work very closely between the two teams to make sure we get the most appropriate coverage uh, and that that where evidence is required because there might be criminal aspects to that investigation that it's captured in in, in the most appropriate way. Thank you Richard for that offer that'd be very useful. Karen would you want to come back on this? Thank you, Chair. I, I think um, Richard's probably just just covered it pretty pretty much, but it, it was all around, um, you know, the other sources of assurance and where the assurance is coming from. So we are part of your assurance framework, but quite rightly, assurances come from a wide range, HMI, CFRS, um, internal arrangements and so forth. So it's really teasing out, you know, where we can best play that part from a risk management control and governance perspective. and and. Uh, and, and sort of, I think you're absolutely right. I think you know ethics and and conduct and those sorts of things need to form part of the ongoing dialogue and discussion. But but really getting under the skin of where we can add value uh, for the reasons that Richard's just outlined um, within our ex areas of expertise, if that makes sense. Okay, Karen, thank you. Before I um, invite other questions, uh, I noticed Matthew Watson, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to um, uh, consolidate some of the comments that so, that have already been made. So um, uh, the reason why I uh, raised up uh, the request for um, internal audit around the vetting procedures was um, off the back of the uh, Sarah Everard and the Home Secretary ordering um, or requesting HMIC undertake a, a thematic inspection 
around a number of uh, uh, vetting aspects nationally. The outcome of the, that that uh, inspection won't be known until uh, later on uh, this year. And, I'm, uh, uh, and the thinking was is that um, pending the outcome of those um, th those inspection findings, it would be worthwhile to get some um, some interim um, uh, assurance that the arrangements that we had in place already were effective. Uh, so that it placed us in the best position to be able to um, respond to anything further that comes out of those thematic inspections. HMIC um, also wrote recently to the force to say that um, uh, there are a number of other uh, further counter corruption and vetting inspections that will be ongoing later on this year. And Hampshire um, will be one of those forces that will be that will be subject um, to those further inspections. Um, dates haven't been set for that. And then, of course, the wider legitimacy um, uh, question um, and ethics question will also form part of the uh, the the the, um, the remit of the HMIC peel inspection that will be going on throughout this year as well. So there's a number of ranges of different inspection uh, led by HMIC, which will be um, informing uh, our understanding of uh, of how well our arrangements uh, are set up within the force alongside whatever comes out of the internal audit activity. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for that. OK, Liz. Yes, I'd just like to follow on from Richard's suggestion of further training. We have met with the standards people before and that was interesting, but one imagines the Met had all sorts of policies, standards and procedures in place, but there was enough wriggle room for people to um, not get picked up. So I think as part of that training, it would be very interesting to see for, to hear how things can go wrong, why they went wrong and. Lessons learned from, you know, from the wider policing community um, and maybe some of that will come out from some of the audits that are taking place currently, but maybe towards the end of this year, we could have a roundup of of um, what's been gleaned. Excellent, please. Yeah, thank you, Liz. That's a very good suggestion. So we will we will arrange accordingly. Catherine. Yes, thank you, Melvin. I just had a couple of more general points on yeah. the plan. Um, firstly, Karen, to welcome the the focus on estates, and obviously it makes sense that you do that later on in in the year, bearing in mind where we are and, and what we've learned this morning. Um, and also the scrutiny of health and safety and risk. I would echo what. Peter has said about obviously we only see the high level risk registers, but quite often we see the same risk expressed in a slightly different way um, between the two organisations. And sometimes that's perfectly legitimate because there might be differential impacts. But sometimes I feel there's a there's a slight lack of clarity, perhaps in, in terms of that. So it would be helpful if, if you your, if your team could look at that. And my only other question was you've obviously put in a high number of days up to 256, do you actually anticipate delivering that number of days or, or is it likely to drop down? Thank you, Catherine. Um, when we develop the plan, um, we, 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 we have in mind, obviously, the, the contractual norm, if you like, um, but that we is it's impossible to plan to the exact number of days. So we do sure. we do plan it according to the identified risk and need um, at that time. And for all the reasons that we've just discussed, it, it is it is a plan and it does fluctuate during the year and experience shows us that it does tend to level out. And, and our philosophy as a partnership is that we're looking to make sure that that, you know, that fluctuation, um, you know, levels over a three year period. We, we, we don't worry about the the odd ups and downs between years. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, Thanks. Just a couple of questions from me just to round off. You've got uh, six days in for the national fraud I initiative. I mean, we're, we're hearing all the time about fraud increasing rapidly. Um, we've got six days. Can you just tell a little bit about this fraud initiative? Maybe Richard can, can explain. 
Yeah, so uh, we're, we're required um, by statutory regulation to contribute to the National Fraud Initiative. And essentially it's a data collection exercise. And so we send in a lot of data. Uh, centrally, they process that data to examine where there might be some issues which organisations, and there's a large, very large number of public sector organisations, might need to investigate. And so they send those hits, as they call them, back to us. And we then have to look into each of those to see whether there might be an issue there or not. It tends to be much more useful for other parts of the public sector than the police. So uh, where, where we're looking at mainly is, is around local authorities who might be uh, allowing some people to have council tax benefit, perhaps because they, they're registered as unemployed on their council tax benefit system. And it turns out that another part of the public sector is paying them as an employee. And so where those people might come up as a match and there's a hit there, then it's sent back to those authorities to investigate whether there might be some fraudulent activity there. So overall, the, this exercise um, has saved millions of pounds from fraudulent activity across the public sector. But from a from a narrow policing uh, perspective, it's it's never saved us anything. It's never thrown up anything which saved us any money. Uh, but it's still important that we contribute to it because there might be data which comes from us, which helps to identify fraudulent activity which is un being undertaken and is relevant for another public sector organisation. Thank you, Richard. Um, my final question, uh, Karen, on the, on the governance issue of the audit plan, the JAC has given its comments. You've consulted with various people in both the constabulary and the PCC, but after hearing all this and, and hearing our input, this ultimately, I think I'm correct in saying, will go to the PCC and the Chief Constable for some sort of uh, sign off or ratification? Yes, yeah, so the, the process is um, we consult with the delegated officers. Um, to get to this stage, we bring it to you for comment. And I think most of the comments, I think that really helpful today, but probably affect future years um, yeah. plans, perhaps going forward and, and, and are ones for us to tease out during the year. Um, because I think, you know, those, those conversations around uh, behaviours, uh, conduct, ethics, uh, cu culture are, are quite difficult to tease out when they, they, they cut across quite a number of, of, of areas. Uh, but I, again, subject to your thoughts and recommendations, yes, that would go th forward to um, the Chief Constable and PCC for their um, for, for their agreement. So they are cited on and ratified the plan formally. I, I probably need to look to Richard and Andy just to, to to properly confirm that what happens next. But that is my understanding. Yes. Yeah, the plan plan shared with with them is our is the chief finance officer's statutory responsibility to have adequate and effective audit so so yeah. the plans have to be signed off by myself and andy definitely and then, and then we sort of share the plans as well for, for their awareness yeah because they own the plan ultimately i guess uh well in the internal audit plan be owned by andy and myself so right as the chief finance officers we have the statutory responsibility so you own the plan okay yeah. thank you thank you for clarifying OK, are there any other questions for Karen? Thanks for that, Karen. Thank you. So we'll move on to the auditor's annual report and we have Sarah, I think, to introduce. Welcome, Hi. Sarah. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, so this is a relatively short one for me. Um, so it's in response to us concluding our 2021 audit. So we signed our unqualified opinion on the 12th of October. Um, and as part of our responsibilities, we are to share with you our annual audit letter, which is what is set out in front of you. That just runs through our conclusions in our audit. So it talks about, first of all, the unqualified opinion. It concludes on the audit risks that we had identified and the responses and results of our procedures. Um, it concludes on the audit materiality that we used, which there's no change in either the risks or materiality from the audit results report we'd previously shared with you. And then the final section, which is new for this year, or it's more expanded than we've we've shared previously, is the commentary on value for money. So this is 
as a result of the NAO's 2020 code, so it was revised in 2020 and the auditor guidance note. Um, so we have to conclude on three areas, financial sustainability, governance and improving economy efficiency and effectiveness. Um, so we concluded those procedures at the same time as our audit procedures on the excuse me, on the financial statements. And there are no matters for us to report, but that's just a bit of extra commentary for you to, to understand how we got to that conclusion. Uh, the only area that is still outstanding in relation to the 2021 audit is our audit of the whole government accounts, and that's because the instructions have not yet been released. So as soon as we've got those, we will conclude those procedures um, and that will be 2021 kind of finally done and dusted. Um, and at this stage, I will pause and ask if anyone's got any specific questions on any of the content. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, I found that report uh, very useful. We're pleased about the unqualified uh, report. On the last point you made about your awaiting procedures from the NAO, could this have any impact retrospectively on what happened in, on your reporting for 2021? So, the only impact will be in relation to we've not released our audit certificate and that is to say that we've completed our whole government accounts. So that's just essentially consolidating the balances that go up into the central government consolidated numbers. So we just say that what we've audited is uh, in line with what they've seen being consolidated up. So in terms of our opinion on the financial statements, it won't change, but we'll either conclude the numbers are the same or are not the same. But from previous experience, we the only differences we tend to note are where we've identified audit differences that haven't been corrected. And they're okay. usually not material enough for uh, whole government accounts to have any issue with that. OK, thank you, Sarah. Questions? I have Peter. Um, Sarah, could I just ask on the question of uh, Ian Y's fees, Obviously, there's a reference to uh, a negotiation that's required because um, in why consider that there's been additional considerable additional work. Uh, can I can you just remind me what the what the contractual position is? You 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 are you a four year appointment on the PSAA? How does it work? Yes, yeah, so we are appointed by the PSAA and that is up for renegotiation in the next couple of years so they're starting to initiate that process for retendering and what that um, means for you is they set a scale fee um, of what they think the audit should cost and if there are any variations we go through what's called a scale fee variation process so we discuss that with management so we would discuss it with Andrew and Richard but it, ultimately the decision is made by the PSAA whether to award that or not um, those conversations historically have taken a considerable amount of time to, to go through the process. So we've only just in the last, I think, month and a half concluded on the 1920 scale fee variation. So that's the figures um, that you should, you should be able to see in the report there. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're going through that process now for 2021. So we have quantified what we think the scale fee variation should be for 2021 based on the additional procedures we had to perform. They're mainly in response to um, changes in regulation, which wouldn't have been in place when the scale fee was set. So it's value for money, the new value for money arrangements that we had to work through. And then there's changes in auditing standards in relation to going concern and estimates. Um, so that's the three areas uh, where the, the, the most the, the scale fee that we've, we've set for 2021 uh, relates to. We are in the process of talking to the PSAA to understand how they want to go through that process for 2021. So at this stage, we haven't had any conversations with Andrew and Richard about the proposed fee. Um, we've, we've just indicated what we think it'll be in that report. Um, but once that's concluded and gone through both management and the PSAA, we will then report to you on what the final scale fee variation is. They just give me an idea. What was the? Um, you said there was a 1920 uplift, which has just been just been finalised. What was that in pounds and percentages? Uh, the figure should be in the report. So let me just get the page for you. Uh, yeah, so you'll see it on page 121 of your pack. So that's the 14,566 pounds. 
That's the uplift. Yeah, so that's that's what they what's agreed that, with. What's, to that, be a, what's that as a percentage increase on the on the scale? Uh, if you bear with me, I can quickly calculate that for you. Uh, Come, you're an accountant, you can do <laughs> it. Right, it's about 30%, isn't it? It's about a third, uh, isn't it? How much? Roughly, give or take. How many percent? Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's about, about 30%. Third, percent. It, Sorry, I can't hear you. 30 or 13? Three zero. 30. 30. 30. Three zero, yeah. Okay, and what does your proposed... Um, scale adjustment amount to in terms of pounds and percentage on this year on the last year so um what we've got for this year is well i guess kind of working backwards last year we shared with you um what we had noted in terms of we felt that the scale fee was not reflective of actually the base requirements that we have to do and the scope associated with associated with the risk so we shared a paper with you last year on our proposal to up, uplift the base scale fee. Um, so for 2021, we have we have based that as 23,000, and that was the same figure that we shared with you previously. So we haven't changed that from when we when we shared okay, that with the audit committee sorry, in 1920. But in terms of the scale fee variation, uh, in terms of the changes in requirement for value for money estimates and going concern that we've got as 8,500. The slight difficulty we've got is when the PSA have uh, agreed the fee variation for 1920, they've not disaggregated between what we've called the uplift in the scale fee and the scale fee variation. They've just given us kind of one figure um, for 1920. So that's why on the report in, on page 121, it looks slightly different where we've got different lines. Now, so there's two aspects to an increase. There's a scale fee variation and there's an uplift. There's two different aspects. Could you just tell me what those are again? I don't understand the difference. Yeah, so the uplift is us essentially saying that we actually don't think that the base scale fee is reflective of the amount of work that we have to do. Um, so we actually we think that that is too low based on the, the increasing regulation and auditing requirements. Yes. Um, then there's the additional, if there is additional pr procedures that we need to do, that's the scale fee variation. So that's the element that can change year on year, whereas the uplift is what we are saying is what the fee should be uplifted to in order to, to be reflective of, of the audit without any additional requirements or any issues, any delays that we might, we might have. Have you taken into account when you quote for the job in the first place? Yes, it, it is, but I, the the environment, if that's if that the right word, has, has changed significantly from when we did we did do that. Uh, so if you if we think about the the process that we're going through at the moment, we're in the process of tendering for an appointment that starts twenty four twenty five, um, and that's a kind of four or five year appointment. So if you think about when we tendered for this, it would have been about four or five, six years ago, and the environment has significantly changed in the amount of work that we have to do from then until now. Yeah, OK, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the, the distinction between the, the uplift and the scale fee variation, because they both seem to depend on you doing more work. But OK, what's the percentage that 23,000 represents, please? Percentage uplift? 50, 50, right? 50. Yeah, it's about 50%. So I, my own, my personal comment, I can't obviously speak for the committee, is that these aren't adjustments, they're wholesale renegotiations of a tendered fee. But anyway, I'll leave the officers and the PSAA to um, sort it all out. OK, thank you, Peter. Andy? Um, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, obviously, we do talk to Sarah um, and colleagues around the fees, um, and PSA will always be interested whether as an organisation, we agree or don't agree with the additional work uh, fees proposed. Um, so that dialogue does take place. Um, and I think just generally, we've mentioned this previously. Um, again, I think I can speak for Richard on this. We we recognise that over the last couple of times, you know, since the Audit Commission disappeared, there's kind of been a race to the bottom on audit fees, uh, probably to the extent that they're now not sustainable at the level they were. So I think we'd fully expect at least a similar level of fee to come in, or if not more, when this is retended by a PSEX, I think that just reflects the environment um, 
that the audit world's in and the increased regulation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was going to say thank you for the um, annual report, Sarah. Um, I think it's uh, quite a good capture of what's um, taken place. Um, so thank you for that. It's been a really useful document. Um, and the only other one is not to put you on the spot, just to maybe flag just an issue, um, which you might be able to comment on now, but if not, more than happy you should come back to us later. And that's just in relation to looking forward um, for the current year's accounts. Um, and really just um, the SIP for consultation, the emergency consultation around um, perhaps not proceeding with um, IRS 16 and property valuations. And I don't know how close your firms are to that and whether you're aligned to SIP for thinking if that goes through or whether we're going to end up in a strange position of a SIP for position over here, kind of unwound by an EY position over there, if you see what I mean. Yeah, uh, so I am aware of the emergency consultations that are that have been released in the last week or so. Uh, so I think there was two. There was one in relation to deferring IFRS 16 and one in relation to property plant and equipment valuation yeah. and potentially using more of an indexation approach. Um, so that's one thing that we'll probably talk to you about in our audit planning meeting in the next couple of weeks, just to get your view on it. We are aware of it. We're, we're waiting to see kind of what what comes of that, the, the difficulty will be whether or not it comes out as a guidance note or whether or not it's actually it's actually uh, the standards are changed. Um, so we'll kind of have to play it by ear. I guess we have and we'll start to pull together the firm's views um, from kind of early conversations. I'm not sure going to an indexation approach is really resolves problems. I think it just pushes pushes problems down the line and I know from your your own um, property team that actually for 22 for the 21-22 period actually a lot of your valuations have already been completed so for for yourselves um, as an authority it, 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 may, it would maybe make sense just to continue with the work that's substantially complete anyway and that your valuations happen throughout the year because of the the quantum of uh, properties and land that you've got to value um, but it's certainly something we will keep in contact closely with you as as things develop yeah thanks sarah and probably i should start by saying the committee apologies you may not have picked up but sip for literally the last couple of days at the least uh, what they've called emergency consultation on whether uh, the first thing is a proposed change that we should be implementing um which is ifrs 16 and the second one is whether we go through the whole process of up, uplifting or valuing properly plant and equipment uh, for the balance sheet. Um, SIP for proposing that neither should take place for this year end. Um, I think it's a three or four week consultation. So we'll wait and see what happens. But it, the, the really the, the question to Sarah is about how aligned the kind of the audit firms will be with anything that comes out from SIP. But we don't want to kind of be stuck in the middle of opposing views, I guess, is, is the main concern for South Richard. Thank you, Andy. Gordon, you have a question. You're on. You're on mute, Gordon. You're on mute, Gordon. Sarah, thank you. Um, just a quick question: Are you providing any other services to the PCC or to Hampshire other than um, audit services, accountancy services? So uh, for 2021, there was a non-audit service provided um, that was, I'm sure that was documented in our audit results report. Um, it's not the audit team, but it is EY that, that performed that. Um, for 21-22 period, I'm not aware of anything um, at this stage. OK, so you're managing the, so any sort of conflict of interest? Yes, and we go through an approval process and it's always documented in um, our, first of all, our audit plan that we share with you, which will come to the next audit committee, which I think is in the middle of May. Um, and then again, in our audit results report, we just conclude on any non-audit services that we provide. But there's, yeah. uh, there's a stringent process that is in place. The other thing to mention is the, the services we provide in relation to the Integrated Business Centre, um, which again is EY, but that's contracted through the County Council. OK, thank you. OK, any other questions for Sarah? Well, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Chair. Very useful report.
Okay, that completes uh, the public part of the meeting. So we will move on to the confidential part of the meeting, which I believe is not recorded.